I think every subject in the Bible is important. Every single subject is important, but I have to say worship is like up there, number one in importance. And I'm gonna share why. And today, really the question I'm gonna answer is why is God worthy of our worship? And what is worship? So let me define first of all what worship is. I love the quote by Tim Keller. He says this, everyone worships something. The only choice we get is what we worship. Everyone worships something. The only choice we get is what we worship. And the English word worship comes from worth shit. So whatever we give worth to, whatever we give value to is what we worship. I love this quote by Louis Giglio. He says, worship is our response to what we value the most. Worship is our response to what we value the most. So here's a good question. How do I know what I am worshiping? How do I know what I'm worshiping? This might sting a little bit, but it's meant to help us. This is what Luke Igleo says. You simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance. At the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And whatever or whoever is on that throne is what's of highest value to you. And on that throne, is what you worship. Wow. So if I evaluate my life, it's whatever or whoever I love the most is a sign of what I worship. Whatever I've devoted myself to the most, whatever I care about the most, whatever I think about the most is worship. And so now that's what worship is for everyone in the world. Because everyone worships. It's whatever they devote their hearts and minds to, whatever they give their lives to, that's actually a sign of what they worship. The church, as believers of God, we worship God, right? That's right. Amen. We worship God. And, and, and we're always, here's the thing, I want to say this up front in this series. We're never perfect, right? right? It's not an excuse to live, you know, however we want. We're on that journey of being perfected by the word of God, by the Holy Spirit, over time, spiritual maturity. And so I'm praying this series helps us mature in our worship, but I haven't arrived yet either. I'm still learning how, how do you actually worship God and be fully devoted to him all the days of your life? Well, that's gonna take all the days of your life. But it, it's gotta start with us focusing on doing that and being intentional of surrendering and giving our hearts to worship God. So I wanna to go to Psalm 96. I love this Psalm when it comes to worshiping God because it covers a little bit of everything. You can use your phones if you want. Psalm 96, I'm, I'm reading the New Living Translation. If you have your Bibles, it might look a little different if you do not have the New Living Translation. And, and just, you're gonna see all these different ways that we worship God in this Psalm. Psalm 96, verse one says, Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Each day. I love this. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. We live in a society where we can publish something every day on social media, can't we? Or we can publish something in our emails or our text messages. We can publish to our friends of the glorious deeds in the world. Now we can actually spread the good news around the world. I had a pastor tell me from Africa that he's using our sermons on Sundays to preach the gospel in Sierra Leone, Africa. Amen. I didn't expect that. Right? So thank God for technology as long as we use it the right way, right? That's not it. I get an email a couple months ago from India, and a church in India is listening to our sermons and teaching them to their congregation. Praise God. That's God Amen. preaching the word around the world. And I'm sure they do that with other churches and get other words from other people, but wow, it's so cool. So great is the Lord, verse 4. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols 
but the Lord made the heavens. Do you know what the Hebrew word for God's is, the small g? The Hebrew word is worthless. The Hebrew word that is used, I can't pronounce it, means worthless in the English language. Wow. So he's saying here that they're worthless. Worthless. But the Lord isn't because he made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Have you ever sat down one day and just recognized that God is amazing? This is a true story. I'm, I'm sitting down um, as a teenager playing. I'm, I'm paintballing. Okay, I'm, I'm, out in a, I'm out in some woods paintballing with my friends. Of course, I was winning. I was destroying them, you know. So I was relaxing. No, I was <laughs> No, I used to get shot all the time. I'm a big dude trying to hide in the woods. It doesn't work very well. I'm paintballing. And I'm sitting there. And I had this moment where I just recognized how good God is. And it was really subtle. I'm, I'm paintballing and I'm thinking about my friends and how I have great friends, right? And as I'm paintballing, all of a sudden this sun ray just hits me in the face through all these leaves. And there's this peace and stillness and quiet because everyone got out, I guess, and I was still hiding because I was scared for my life now. <laughs> sure. And I'm hiding and then I'm, then I'm hearing birds sing. And then I saw a green snake slithering up a tree, like not too far from me. That was a little creepy. But I'm sitting there and I'm just reflecting on the goodness of God in my life. And I don't know how that happened because I should be worried about someone sneaking up on me to shoot me. And instead, in that moment, I had a moment with God where I just recognized the beauty of God all around me. The fact, yeah, you give God glory because it happens. And maybe you've realized that in your life as well. Maybe you've seen that. And it's such a strange way of explaining that, but it, it is what it is. That's what happened that day. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his courts. And that could be any kind of offering, a praise offering, uh, a tithe. It could be whatever you want to bring to God, you bring it into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. And then I love this. It says, let all the earth tremble before him. Tell all the nations the Lord reigns. Now listen, this is actually an evangelistic verse. This is God inviting the whole world, not just Jewish nation, the, the Gentile nation, anyone to come worship God. It says, tell all the nations the Lord reigns. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. He would judge all peoples fairly. Let the heavens be glad. Now nature worships God. The earth rejoice. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest rustle with praise before the Lord, for he is coming. Now, this is interesting because in our time and day right now, it seems like God is coming soon, doesn't it? It says this, he is coming to judge the earth. He would judge the world with justice or fairness and the nations with his truth. Wow. If there's not reasons to worship God, in that, I don't know what there is. Look at this quote from my, from my mom, my mother. I thought this was an awesome definition. Worship is our response, both personal and corporate, to God for who he is and what he has done. Worship is expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live. See, worshiping God, 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 is, God is just way too big to just worship him on Sundays for an hour and a half. He's just way too big for that. And in fact, if we only worship God in church, we have minimized God to a lower G when he is worthy of our entire life. He's worthy of our entire life. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, to receive it, not for us to receive it, for him to receive it. For you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. I love that verse. I love that. We get to see God in Jesus. 
He existed. This is Jesus. Jesus existed before anything was created. Wow. And is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. That's why we were made in Christ's image. Because it was through him. He was the blueprint for how we would be made. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. And he holds all creation together. And I love this quote from Chuck Lawless in his book, Discipled Warriors. He says, worship is the proper response of the created to the creator. Mm. Worship is the proper response, response of the created to the creator. And then I threw in my definition. Just because I'm a pastor and I should do that. <laughs> worship is a lifetime devoted to God, displaying his matchless worth. And amazing grace. I'm sorry, I'm matchless worth. I apologize for that title. I'm matchless worth and amazing grace. But here's the thing. There are a lot of definitions for worshiping God. But there is only one God who should be worshipped. There's only one God who should be worshipped. And the thing is, is we could, we could define worship worshiping God in so many ways because it's not, you can't put God in a little box or one little definition. I mean, you cannot, you cannot put a definition on one line and say that's, that's worship of God. It just doesn't do justice for the greatness of God, does it? So here's the thing though. What we're learning here is that God is worthy of worship. Why is he worthy? He is worthy of worship simply because he created us. We wouldn't be here enjoying life if it wasn't for God. That's right. But what's beautiful about God is he doesn't just make us so that he gets just something from us alone, but we get something out of it. Have you thought about that for a second? He, we get something out of it. We get to enjoy him and his blessings and his favor and his presence, his people. But something happened in the garden. Worship was hindered. Worship was obstructed. See, what happened was Satan, he came in on the scene and he tempted Adam and Eve to try to elevate themselves equal with God and know what he knows. Because he said, oh, don't, that's not true. You won't, you won't die if you eat that fruit. God just doesn't want you to know what he knows. And so what did they do? They gave in and they ate that fruit because their desire was to, to kind of match what Satan wanted and that was to be like God or better because Satan wanted to be better than God. And, and Satan doesn't want you and I to worship God because it's the foundational fact that, that he's not being worshiped and God is. That's right. Have you thought about that for a second? Think about that. That's why Satan's going to attack your focus and your devotion and your loyalty to God first because it gets your eyes off of God and gets your eyes on yourself and everything else. See, they became selfish in that moment when they disobeyed God. And that sin hindered and obstructed and damaged our world greatly, didn't it? And we're still paying the penalty for it. You know, I was reading through... Exodus, and I love the correlation of Exodus and the New Testament of Jesus Christ, because sin had caused now captivity of the Israelites, God's people, for 400 years in Egypt. They were slaves to the Egyptians for 400 years. They cried out to God, and God heard them, and God heard them in a way that he sent someone to go and that was Moses now Moses had been gone out of Egypt for quite some time but he knew the land he knew the lay of the land he knew what he was dealing with because he used to be in it what's interesting is sanctification is to be set apart do you know what God did God set Moses apart from Egypt by pulling him out of Egypt 
And God does that with us. He pulls us out of sin and sets us apart because Moses did a grave sin, didn't he? He killed someone. So God sets him apart and purifies him and now sends him back to Egypt to set them free. For what purpose? Set them free so they may worship God. Every single time Moses went to Pharaoh, he said, we must go into the desert to worship God. But see, they were captive. They were captive and they were hindered by this captivity. But what happens? God sends Moses. Finally, after 10 plagues, Pharaoh lets them go. They're heading out into the desert and they get to a a Red Sea that is in their way. And God wants them to cross this Red Sea, but there's no way to cross it. And behind them is the Egyptians, their past their enslavement, their captivity, once again, coming after them. Listen real quick. I'm getting ready to connect this to whoever has felt shame about their past and have not been set free. It chases you down, doesn't it? It chases you down and tries to enslave you again, that you have not been set free from that. See, here's what happens. God makes a way where there is no way He opens the Red Sea. The Israelites walk through. And then the Egyptians step into the water. But listen, what happens next is beautiful because it connects to us spiritually. When the water came crashing down, it swept away their past and their enslavement. The reviving water of Jesus Christ, the living water of Jesus Christ comes into your life and cleans and cleanses you and sanctifies you and set you free from your past. The first thing they did when they were set free was worship. They crossed the river, and this is what Exodus 14, I'm sorry, the sea, Exodus 14, 31 says, when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. That was their first act of worship. They were in wonder. They were amazed by God. Then they put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then, so faith is also to worship God. Faith is to trust in God. Then they also sing songs about deliverance. This story in Exodus is a foreshadowing of what Jesus came to do for us. It was a telling of what Jesus would do in the future for mankind. God acted on our behalf. We're actually crying out for help. We're crying out for freedom more than we realize. And God hears our cries and he sends help. He sends Jesus. Jesus gives his life on the cross. He sacrifices his offering. Jesus' offering to God was his life, was his obedience, was his perfection because it's the only thing that can set us free because no man could pay the penalty that Jesus could pay for us because he was perfect. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. The response to Jesus is to put our faith in Christ. Isn't that interesting? The first thing, when I, when I realized what Jesus did for me as a teenager, I was in awe. And then I realized that I must put my faith in him, so I put my faith in him again. I did it when I was a kid. But when I became a, a, young, a young teen, I, 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 said, I, I realized more. And I put my faith and trust in God. And then it was in that moment where God set me free to do something. He set me free to live for him or worship him. And this is exactly what happens. We give our lives to Christ. We put our faith in Jesus. And he gave us a way. Listen, Colossians 1, 19. We're back in Colossians 1 again. It's on the screen for you. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He fixed it. He restored it. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Wow. Can I read that one more time? Because God needs you to hear this today. He needs you to believe it too. 
Jesus made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by Christ's blood. That's some powerful blood. I'm going to read that again one more time. <laughs> he made peace possible, in other words, with everything in heaven and on earth. So whatever we're struggling to believe today that God has set us free from, we have to understand something. He set things free in heaven too. Your situation is not impossible for him. Amen. He has authority over all things in heaven and on earth. Can we give him glory right now in Jesus' name? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wow. And it took his life to do it. Verse 21. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies because of sin. Separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled or restored you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. In other words, he literally had to die for us. It couldn't be a spiritual sacrifice. It had to be his whole body laid down on the cross for us. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. Now, this is what happens when you believe in Jesus Christ spiritually. Because physically, this will be fully realized when Jesus comes back. Spiritually, right now, you have been brought into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Wow. Mm. Woo. Because this is what happens. God sees Jesus standing in front of you and says, you are righteous. He doesn't see your shame or your past or your sin. We do. We do. We have a hard time shaking that. We have a hard time, even the sin that hurt us, that wasn't your fault. The sin that hurt you and it wasn't your fault. We can shake that and we can look past because Jesus has made peace with all things in heaven and on earth Amen. through him. But it takes faith to believe it, doesn't it? It took faith for Moses to raise that staff or touch the water and make that water move. I mean, think about that. Hey, Moses, put your staff you know, near the water, in the water, above the water, whatever, and then it's going to open up. Wow. What if it doesn't work, God? I'm going to look like a fool in front of everyone. Come on now, that's what fear says, right? Jesus grieved at the fact that he would die. He was crying in the garden. He was suffering, saying, if this shall pass from me, please let it pass, the cup. But if not, I will do whatever you want, God. So Jesus even had to believe and move forward and trust in his Father, and he did it. And the cross was raised and the way was made through for all mankind. Jesus is the way through. And here's the thing. Your past captivity is washed away. Amen. Praise God. That's the gospel. Look at this scripture from Hebrews 10. I want to connect sacrifice. I have a little bit of time. I want to connect sacrificial worship because worship in the Old Testament was they, they brought offerings of animals and they would sacrifice them. And we don't do that today, do we? Aren't you glad? Because I think sheep are cute, you know? That's the way God worked at that time. And now he has a new covenant through Jesus Christ. So everything changes. It says this, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. So they brought animal sacrifices every year, multiple times too, for different offerings, and it was unable to perfectly cleanse us from our sin. They would just appease God for that moment. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. Wow. 
For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. That would be the next slide. There we go. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the scriptures. First Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifice or sins or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them. Though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. That's why sacrifices have ceased and they don't, exact, they don't happen anymore because the greatest sacrifice, the Lamb of God, died on the cross for us. Amen. But why? Well, to set us free to worship Him. Jesus gave us all. Jesus sacrificed Himself for us. And the crazy thing is, is God was already worthy of worship, wasn't he? Because he created us. Now it's just icing on the cake because he's redeemed us. He was already worthy because, well, we exist to be in fellowship and, and worship him. And now it's just icing on the cake because when sin is jacking everything up, he fixes it. I thought about this last night. I couldn't sleep for a little bit and I was thinking about this last night. The, the stuff that's going on in our world isn't normal. That's not what God intended. God intended for this place to be amazing. Amen. And for people to love one another and, and not hurt each other. For there to be peace on earth. That was the intention of earth. Isn't that wild? And he's restoring it every time he fixes a person. Every time he saves someone, he's restoring it. Pastor used to say this all the time. One less person living for the world is one more person living for God. Amen. Amen. One more person worshiping God. So Romans 12, 1 says this in the NIV. I really like the NIV version of this. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because you see what he's done for you. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I'm not beating up Sunday morning when I say this, because we're going to discuss Sunday morning worship in a couple of weeks. But true and proper worship is our entire lives as an offering to him. And this is why we worship more than, than, than just a song. It's, it's offering a living sacrifice, by the way. When they offered a sacrifice back then, it died. It couldn't do anything for them. Well, Jesus offers himself, he dies, and then he comes back to life, right? Amen. And lives. Because he is a living sacrifice for God. And he continues to worship God. And guess what? He's saying the proper worship here. Paul is saying in view of what God has done for you, the proper worship is for us to offer our lives as a living offering or sacrifice to God. It's not about us, church. Worship is not about ourselves. It's about God. He bought our way from hell. He ransomed us from sin. We didn't do it. We don't get the right to steal his worship and make it about us. We should be humbled in such a way that it's all about Jesus. It's all about God. Every day, every song, every thought, all of it belongs to God. That's why worship to God, in closing here, worship to God is expressed through loyal devotion, praise and adoration, Obedience in holiness, songs in dancing. I wrote that down days ago. And we talked about dancing this morning. But by the way, Pastor Ryan danced in his house this, this past week. I don't do that. I just started worshiping God and, and, and spinning around trying not to fall on the ground. 
But I was so full of joy because the songs that I was singing, the meditation I had of God that day, the word I had read to study for this sermon, all of it just made me full of joy and I couldn't help but worship God with my hands lifted and, and dancing as, as best as I possibly could. It was crazy. But listen, so is artistic expression, art and writing. Are you a painter? Are you an artist? That is worship unto God. Loving God and loving others is worship. Unity and peace, joy and encouragement, tithing and generosity, serving and sacrificing, all of this is an expression of worship because we do it all for the glory of God. That's right. And I thought about this because my mom and I were talking. The reason why my mom and I were talking is because she's going to come up here and speak in, in two weeks with me to talk about how we worship on Sundays. Because she was our worship director and our creative arts director for how many years? 25, 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted her to come up and share her experience and her knowledge with you. And so we were talking, and I told my mom, I said, when, when I run out of words to worship God, my life continues to be an offering of praise. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth, church. When we run out of words, our lives continue to be an offering of praise. Can we stand together? We're just scratching the surface on this series. There is so much to be taught about this, and it really does alter and change the way you live and the way you see God. And I have to tell you this, the more you know God, the stronger your worship is, the more pure it is. So I wanna encourage you as a church to be studying God in the book of Psalms, to study the word of God, to read the Bible, get an idea of who God is more and more, get to know him more through the word. It changes the way you worship him and the way you live for him. Now today, there, were, there was, God was speaking. God was speaking to someone or many in this room who needs to believe that he has set you free. We had a worship leader telling us, and then we had the word of God tell us we are free. With every head bowed and eyes closed. We're not gonna, we're not gonna prolong this, but I got two invites right where you are in your seat. One, you can't properly live and worship God if you don't have him as your Lord and Savior. He did, I just, I just presented the gospel to you as best as I could. He did all that for you so you would not be captive to your sin or your past. He washes it away. If that's you in this room, would you hold a hand up so I know that there's a response today to salvation so we can pray for you? Because we're gonna lead you in that prayer through the screen. Any hands up? I, I couldn't see. Just hold it up real quick for me. Awesome, I see one, two. Any others? Three, praise God. Four, five, six. Yes, thank you, God. We're gonna pray this prayer right now and then I'm gonna pray for those who have been in bondage of their past. So with me, church, everyone who raised their hand, you're saying that I receive what Jesus has done for me and I will be a new person. He makes me new on the inside to live for him on the outside. Get ready, let's pray this. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your son, Jesus, to die for my sin. I believe I am forgiven and confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. To thank you, I give my life to love and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, praise God. Let's give God glory and praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I know that might have been fast, but listen, God has already been working on your heart as you sat here today. Those of you who raise your hand, and he has, set, he has set you free, the word of God says, and you are forgiven. He, the work has been done for you, and I encourage you to grow and read the word and get to know him more. Now, those of you who have been in bondage, have been slaves or a captive feeling to your shame and your past, would you just pray with me right now? You don't have to repeat after me. Just believe 
in Jesus right now for what he's done for you. God, we lift up those who cannot shake what's happened in their past, whether it was to them or by them. Lord, we have heard your word clearly today that, Lord, you don't remember that. You let it go. You forgive. You wash it away. So we believe, Lord, that we are set free from that past, set free from that sin, that whether it was against us or whether we did it by our own hands, God, you have cleansed us through your son, through faith in Jesus Christ. So we leave today standing on your word, not our worry or fears, standing on the truth that you've reconciled everything in heaven and on earth. You have fixed all things by your blood. Your blood is powerful. Your blood is great, greater than any sin. We thank you, God. Be with us as we worship you with our entire lives. We offer our lives to you as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hey, bring some people out next week to hear this next sermon. God bless you so much. Have a great day.